Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a great lunch and got relaxed. During our meditation session, by the way, I completely forgot about my grant deadline that's 10 days out. <laughs> However, it's come back to me, so I may... Where's, where's Paul? <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Estella Atacuana, who is the Dean of Letters and Science here uh, at UC Davis, who's going to say a few words. Uh, she is a renowned geophysicist, was the Dean of the College of uh, uh, Earth, Ocean, and Environmental Science uh, previously at the University of Delaware. She's been here about two years, and she's just a wonderful supporter of everything we do in the Center for Mind and Brain, and of course, all across campus, but we are her favorites. <laughs> Dean Atakwana. Right, so good afternoon, and thank you for that warm introduction, and you are my favorite. <laughs> I, since you know, joining UC Davis, I've really come to appreciate a lot about the mind and the brain that I knew nothing about, and just how powerful it is. So it is really my great honor this afternoon to welcome you back to the afternoon session as we celebrate you know, the inauguration of this amazing new partnership between our Center for Mind and Brain and the Chen Institute, whose pioneering work um, in the science of unlocking the human mind has earned much attention and praise. The working title for today's summit is Out of the Lab and Into the World, the Next Chapter of Contemplative Science. And I can confidently say that this new union heralds exactly that, a very exciting new chapter. And as a dean, you know, I've always been wondering especially with a lot of the um, attacks that we are receiving as institutions of higher education. What is our role in educating the next generation, you know, of, uh, of citizens of this country or of the world? And are we missing something? And I think this, this your title is very, it's, it's right on, which means that all the work, the wonderful work that we do needs to be taken out there so that people can see the value of why we exist as institutions of higher learning. So as I'm sure you know that the work being done in the Syrian lab has really made the Center for Mind and Brain a recognized leader in the field for the past two decades. TCCI's reputation for interdisciplinary excellence and innovation really is second to none. I went to their site yesterday and I was quite impressed about the work that they were doing and the partnerships that they are forming, and so I felt really proud that they saw UC Davis as a partner. As, this, as we unite to work with them, I hope we'll be able to enjoy front row seats to what promises to be an incredibly impactful show. Today's meeting, you already began with very important conversations with a very specific question, how can we utilize more integrated and applied perspectives and methods to move the important work out of the lab and into the world? So I ask you to consider certain things as you continue with your presentations today. One, the development of methods that allow research to push beyond the confines of traditional laboratory spaces to better capture and describe people's lived experiences. Two, the importance of considering the greater environmental and social context of their experiences and behaviors. Three, what bridges must we build to ensure success? And lastly, how do we ensure that we remain committed to the greater good? As I've said, you know, how do we serve our society, society better with the work that we do? So as Dean of the Letters and Science, I relate to and support these goals and believe that the CMB TCCI partnership is going to be a brilliant microcosm of our overarching values. We must bridge discipline so that we are best able to understand and serve our world. So wish you the best of luck for the rest of your presentations, and I will sit for a few minutes and listen before I dash off to other meetings. Thank you. So it's now my honor and uh, challenge to sketch the arc of session two, which um, we've heard a lot about 
different uh, individualist versus collectivist, connected versus self-help uh, perspectives in the first session. And this term contemplative science has two meanings, uh, to me at least. One is it's an umbrella term for the transdisciplinary research that's going on in many different levels around the world to investigate the consequences of contemplative practices that might be definable formally. But there's another way I relate to more deeply, and that is contemplative science is doing science contemplatively. And the academy is not tuned to that. The metrics for productivity are not shaped toward depth always. In some fields they are, in others less so. The impacts of studying meditation on a group of people to get average effects, to promote those effects for policymakers and healthcare interventions, assumes that you can instrumentalize a training and an outcome. But it doesn't foreground the variability and individual differences that make up the richness of that average positive or negative effect. As we've heard about memory and fear and the distinction that Deepu brought out that I think is incredibly potent to connect consequences of aversive and traumatizing events with their subsequent healing in our lives of this move from threat to curiosity and curiosity about th the reaction of threat as embodied experience means that we need to broaden our investigative toolkit to detailed phenomenology and understanding individual backgrounds, histories, trajectories, interests, predilections, and what individual people find of refuge in their own lives, as opposed to the idea that we can impose a standardized, manualized intervention that will have some predictable outcome. And the way we go about trying to answer sort of or address those issues, we ourselves have to become reflexive about our own assumptions and what's embedded in our research questions. So in this session, we're going to touch on several different sort of, I imagine it's, it's almost like a tripod of domain talks. In the first talk, Camila Majid is going to really throw down the gauntlet of this need to be self-reflexive as scientists. This is something we are her students. She has taught us so much uh, over the last two years and will be in an ongoing relation, I think, on this point for as long as we can still do this work. The second talk, Uri Hassan is going to, uh, he's a prophet. He, months ago, he wanted to talk about deep learning language models and artificial intelligence. And who knew that everybody would be typing in, you know, write you know, uh, some bluegrass lyrics in the style of Bill Monroe, and then program a computer, and then do your term paper in chat GPT. Then he will be talking about what's behind and under the hood of large language models, and also the ways in which it's informative for how our brains operate on the basis of statistical learning, and how we diverge from these ample, but still compared to the human mind, toy models, even if they have billions of elements. And there'll be interesting questions about what contemplative practice can bring to the anticipation of the next word that humans do 
compared to deep listening and letting things just come in. Lawrence Kermeyer in Montreal, who couldn't be with us today, is going to give us a multicultural perspective on mindfulness that I think will map on to a lot of what Paul mentioned in terms of how different cultures view what is the intent of a contemplative meditative practice. And also this interesting looping back now of mindfulness, secularized mindfulness practices in the countries of origin of these practices. So we will uh, hear from uh, Lawrence uh, at the end of this. So without further ado, I introduce uh, Dr. Majid from uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, and she will join us for her talk. Thank you again, Dean Atacuano, for the wonderful charge. I think the, the invitation for us to think about the, the relevance of our work in the world is, you know, the most meaningful invitation we could have. So deep gratitude for that and for all the support that you've given and deep gratitude to Cliff for the wonderful framing. Uh, you know, everybody who knows Cliff knows he has this vast mind and he can put different pieces together from everything from philosoph philosophy to astrophysics and, you know, a little neuroscience and, you know, everything about Buddhism and kind of make a joke, right? So I <laughs> can carry that thread all the way through. So I have, you know, just such deep gratitude for the collaboration with him and Quinn and Brandon and Aaliyah. And I feel so full of, uh, you know, appreciation, like that, that, that piece of gratitude that is grounded in discernment and in the capacity to see, to discern clearly, I, I feel that um, from all that I've, I've witnessed today. and just want to offer it back um, and invite us all into that, into just maybe a 30-second uh, gratitude practice and allow yourself to just consider, yeah, you know, what arises in your body that you're grateful for, in your mind, and in your heart. Right? We're studying this, we, 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 we study all of these aspects of our being. We can be in a, a discerning and grateful relationship with them too. And what arises when you think about what you're grateful for from this morning? You know, we can just kind of hang out in the, in the gratitude space for a couple of seconds and notice, oh, one thing I'm grateful for about this morning is, or about this gathering is, or about this person or these people in this room is. Have a little delicious silence together while we hang out in glad gratitude. Thank you for doing that with me. You know? Anything come to mind? Anybody want to shout out their gratitudes? We can fill the room with them. One or two. Nothing? Community. Okay. Oh, uh, anybody want to share what came to mind as you reflected on gratitude? Oh, community is what Aaliyah said. Mentors. Mentors. Anything in the chat from the Zoomers?
And it's okay, it can keep coming and hopefully it will keep coming. So thank you again, everyone. And I, I think that's a great place to start as we think about restoring the Elan Vital of our research and how we really practice an inclusive, anti-racist life of inquiry, right? Because when I'm talking about science, I'm not confining it to some kind of institutional or discipline uh, focus. Oh, did we get some on the chat? I'm not able to see it. So does somebody want to share something with me that you're seeing? Continuity, opportunity, and technology, right? That that's what we that's what we get to we get to have, right? And in so many ways that the pandemic was this masterful teacher that was like, you know, you can do more and suffering is a pathway and you know, you can create community despite any circumstances. So yes. Uh, so I'll I'll tell you a little bit about me, just very briefly. My my research looks at, you know, the impacts of, of, of different type of types of oppression on mental health and behavioral health. And so I've studied most, um, in most detail, racism and homophobia as they impact um, LGBTQ people throughout the, throughout the world. And that's what my domestic and international research has focused on. And I'm not gonna talk about that today. What I'm gonna talk about more is some, kind of some of the lessons that I learned from that and how those lessons, in, in addition to engaging my own contemplative practice throughout my work as a researcher, has helped me grow myself um, enough to be, uh, you know, in a, in a co-investigative relationship with people as we do research, right? Someone asked, I think Ari asked, uh, Quinn and Aaliyah during the lunch break about what it was like to do the research project, or, or maybe Ari was asking, you know, all of us, because I was very honored to be able to support um, that work. And, you know, it's a beautiful question. It's like, how were you transformed, right? That that's, how has, how does your inquiry, you know, what is your inquiry, what does our inquiry teach us about ourselves? And to what degree are we participating in research with participants uh, from a perspective that allow that recognizes that we are also being investigated as we investigate, and how much are we learning from the investigation that our participant of our person and of our presentation that our participants are offering us? So I'm very honored to have done that work and to be able to work with a lot of different kinds of uh, organizations and and especially with researchers and research institutes and educational institutes and scientists to, to start returning to some of the less constricted and limiting uh, understandings and interpretations of science and research. And in order to do that, we have to divest them of some of the vestiges of, of colonialism and the vestiges of white supremacy that inhabit um, the academy and uh, inhabit science. I don't think anybody's gonna fall off their chair in shock if I say, there's a history of racism, of science being used to codify racism, right? It's like, you know, a huge thing. And, and the apology that the National Institute of Health made around that last year, I think was a good landmark in terms of us recognizing, okay, we have some repair to do in the whole, in our whole conceptualization of research and scientific inquiry. And of course, the same is true for the academy. So, you know, some of my aspirations, and you know, I call them aspirations because that's what they are. I think it's a nice way of thinking about them. And for me, that restores Elan Vital instead of saying, here's what we're gonna do. Here are our goals. You know, this is this is what we aspire to. And if other things occur and arise along the way, they're welcome. The other learnings are welcome. Um, so, you know, to, to try to think, to try to explore with you this idea of Elan Vital as something that it is enriched if we're really reaching to be inclusive and anti-racist. And if it's embodied, if we're attended to who we are in our bodies and we're atten attending to that, and that we allow creativity, that you know, the, the poetics of science, right? The art of science to be a part of how we are infused and energized. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how white supremacy culture compromises it, our Ilan Vital, how it 
shrinks it and, you know, and, and makes it difficult for us to experience the fullness. And I'll talk a little bit about some language practices that can help us to subvert a, oppression and bias and a, a couple of things about the poetics of science. So what's Elan Vital? Just basically that life force, that, that why, that so what, that why this is important to me, right? Like, so if I were to ask you the question, why, why, you know? Of course, the, the simple answer is because if I measure this, then I'll know how much that, right? And then like a two-year-old, keep asking that question. And why, you know, and why, right? To, to, Dean, um, to the Dean's point about impact, and not just impact in the world, impact relationally, because you're in the world. Like, how does this make your life better? How does this, how is this part of your vigor? What's your, where is your Ilan Vital? in your research? Where is your, what's your motivating force, your raison d'etre? You know, why, why you teach something, why you study something, why you, you know, why you live with a particular inquiry? What is the inquiry that you live with, right? So, or what are the inquiries that you're living with? You know, I, I was um, listening to Sujatha yesterday, and she was like, well, I don't know if I really identify as a scientist. I'm a lawyer. I'm like, you know, everybody's a scientist. We're all in this investigative relationship with reality. And we apply our scholarship to that in different ways. We apply our minds to that in different ways. Uh, so I invite us to, to think about that and, you know, allow ourselves to be imbued with some sense of raison d'etre and, and joie de vivre about our, our work. White supremacy culture does compromise that. I'll talk about a couple of the characteristics of white supremacy culture that have led to this codification of a lot of different types of oppression by quote unquote science, really pseudoscience, right? That tries to make things official by saying, it's been studied. It's been studied, so you people have these problems. We pointed it out. We've proven it, right? So we can, we can, but we can undo it. And the thing that one of the things I want to emphasize about this is a lot of times when I talk about white supremacy culture, people think that it's only white people enact white supremacy culture, but that is not true. You know, African heritage, black people, Latinx people, indigenous people, Asian people, everybody has kind of evolved in this kind of toxic um, milieu. And, you know, we've kind of absorbed the toxins and we spread them around during the pandemic. And during the, the, the peak of the pandemic, I was talking about how the, you know, violent anti-black racism was very much um, just like another virus. It was invisible. It was absolutely everywhere. And everybody thought they didn't have it and assumed they didn't have it. And that the opposite is what we get to do. We get to all assume we have it, including black people and everybody. Assume you have it. And and try to you know clean it off and detox yourself and really try hard not to spread it right and that that is what our contemplative practices get to really support us in doing um, exactly that work. Okay, so yeah, some some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture that I think compromise our Elan Vital and compromise the most expansive view of inquiry that we could have are you know the perfectionism that. Um, you know, focusing on inadequacies and, and even seeing inadequacies as, as opposed to seeing diverse presentations, right? Uh, mistakes reflecting badly on people and that, you know, as opposed to being learning opportunities. I'm just kind of move through these uh, pretty quickly. Some of the antidotes to that are, you know, the developing that culture of appreciation, regardless of the context. You know, I really, this kind of strengths perspective in the most, you know, painful environment and circumstance, there is, you know, transcendent um, courage, wisdom, and insight. I often talk about how people, you know, reflect on the experiences of enslaved people in this country and throughout the world. And, you know, when they think about them, you know, African heritage people, my ancestors kind of singing in these fields, people are often kind of seeing that as, oh, wow, they're happy, you know, despite the circumstance, or maybe they don't grasp the, you know, the fullness of their predicament. Actually, that's self-transcendence, you know, actually that's transmuting suffering, right? So to be able to have a lens that allows you to um, see things from a very expansive space, that that's, that's what it means to excise 
um, white supremacy from inquiry and from investigation, from, from view, right? If you're trying to like think of this from, from the Buddhist lens, right? Because that's the place where I think that science and Buddhism have this lovely relationship, at least in my own experience, of really trying to have right view which does not mean you have the right answers, but that you try to continue to adjust your view to see things clearly, to see things with insight, with wisdom, with compassion, with awareness of the interdependence. Another challenge of white supremacy culture is this sense of urgency. And you know, it's hard not to, to be trapped in it, like, especially when it comes to having to meet deadlines and trying to get things done. One of the challenges and opportunities you know, that um, I, I've had in the work with the um, Contemplative Coping during COVID project with, with Cliff and Quinn and the whole team was, we've got to slow down and talk to some diverse people. We have to have kind of a more dialogic process to even figure out what the right questions are to ask people, right? And that takes time. If you're the researcher and you're like, okay, these are the questions I'm gonna ask, that's it, boom, bit, right? However, if you wanna create something that's inclusive, then it's gonna take a little more time and you might wanna bring a little more people in the discourse. So pausing, right? Slowing down. And creating a little space for that discernment is what is really, is really, I found to be really, really useful and really, really hard. Like I struggle with it myself. I'm struggling with it in this moment because <laughs> I want to say a thousand things to you. And um, you know, and I, I wanna hear your I want to I want to be more interactive. I wanna ask more questions throughout my presentation, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful struggle. It's a good thing to work with. It's a place, it's a place of, of work that keeps, keeps the alum vital alive and keeps the inquiry authentic and alive. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move a little bit quickly and talk about this. The, the worship of the written word is another characteristic of white supremacy that really gets in the way sometimes because we don't value the, for example, the representations of scientific inquiry that have not been published in top tier journals. It's like, if it's not there, it's not science, right? If it, ha if it hasn't been published in a journal, it's not science, right? So that how do we expand our understanding of how me what the meaningful inquiries that have been done and bring those into our conceptualization so that we can actually transmute our, our knowledge into wisdom. Uh, so yeah, that's, those are some thoughts. I love this quote from Glissant. Um, if you're not familiar with that book, Glissant, he's a wonderful philosopher. And uh, you know, this book, The Poetics of Relation, is just one of my uh, favorites, talking about relationality and creating this field of this relational field, Glissant is brilliant when he says, let's move from the oral to the written, because when we do that, we, I said, he says to move from the oral to the written is to immobilize the body and to take control and to possess, right? So that's where we see, like, where is it written? Who owns it? Who's got the copyright to the, you know, as opposed to a more collective conceptualization of knowledge and wisdom that allows it to imbue every community, right? Like that, that it's, why does it need to be owned and restricted in these ways, right? That, that can, if, especially if it's meant to have meaning and does have meaning and value. Dr. Toni Morrison talked about the white gaze, and she talks about how, in the simplest terms, the white gaze can be conceptualized as an assumed white reader. And I invite us to think about that from the perspective of researchers, too. Like, I have been, I'll tell you, at many a scientific presentation, and people are like, you know, well, here's what the blacks do. Well, these are the things in the black community, or sometimes they'll actually say black people. They'll add people to it. And, you know, it's there's so much, um, assumption that the presenter, that the researcher, that the scientist, that the teacher is speaking to white people. And I'm sitting in the front row with maybe three or four, but so that there's a way that that white supremacy creates a blindness, you know, in the most, you know, in the most knowledgeable and in the most studied scholars just really can't literally see 
people in front of them because they'll st keep using pr pronouns like they and them. So one of the things, I, I went up to the presenter at the end of the last one of these I went to and I said, you know, how about language like, you know, those of us who are African American? Because that way you recognize that you are part of a human community and that they are in the room. And it's a great way of thinking about all of our subjects, right, or participants, right, as opposed to saying, you know, the autistic people, right, right, you know what I mean? Those of us who are neurodiverse, those of us who are autistic, just changing the language cha transforms and creates, you know, a more, more of a re relational field between us and our participants and us and our students. Uh, so I don't know if I have time to play this little clip for you from Dr. Morris. Oh, yes, let's bring her in the room because I can't not play her clip out of urgency. That would just be wrong. <laughs> Even if I don't get to talk, I, get, I want her to tell. I have 12 minutes. Okay, thank you. That's a good, I don't know how to make it go forward. It's not doing it. Uh, so I'll, I will just say briefly uh, what I'm going to say next about Dr. Morrison's work because, you know, in addition to talking about the white gaze and making sure, like, who, what voice are you talking in and, and, and who is your assumed audience, right, when we're talking, but also in research. One That's minute, right. one, one, fourteen. So, okay. One minute, one, Actually, yeah. then I need my computer. Yeah, oh. You, can, you have to um, start it and then drag it. Oh, start it and drag it, of course. Oh. Not working. It's OK. Watch this video. It's OK. We can keep moving. Let me, can you take Wait. me back to the slides? I didn't know you were going to be on, on, on the phone. OK. So. No problem. So yes, it's a, great, it's a great one to watch because she talks, she's talking about perspective. She has another book called Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. And again, so much crossover between how we imagine and envision science. Uh, so I want to I want to share the thank you, Cliff, um, where she talks about a, a bit about where she talks about language. Let me skip to that slide. She says, and this is in her Nobel uh, lecture um, in 1993. She says the system. The systematic looting of language can be recognized by the tendency of its users to forego its nuanced, complex, midwifery properties for menace and subjugation. Oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. It does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. Whether it's obscuring state language or the full language of mindless media, whether it is the proud but calcified language of the academy or the commodity-driven language of science, whether it is the malign language of law without ethics or language designed for the estrangement of minorities, hiding its racist plunder in its literary cheek, it must be rejected, altered, and exposed. It is the language that drinks blood, laps vulnerabilities, tucks its fascist, fascist boots under criminals of respectability and patriotism as it moves relentlessly toward the bottom line and the bottom doubt mind. Sexist language, racist language, theistic language, all are typical of the policing languages of mastery and cannot, do not permit new knowledge or encourage the mutual exchange of ideas. So she is not unwavering. <laughs> yes, applause for Dr. Morrison, right? Because her words just kind of say it all. I could kind of end there. And you know, this is why I think that inclusive language practices are really, really helpful. So when we're designing our, our questions and when we're talking about our work, what kinds of words are we using? People who know me have heard me use the ter term coined by Barbara Love, people of the global majority, instead of the term people of color, because I think it creates a nice cognitive shift. Whenever I hear people describe Latinx, indigenous, and Asian heritage um, and African heritage people as minorities, it's always just like, that's just not true. 80%, that's 80% of the world's population, right? So if we're thinking about humanity from a global context, why are we still talking about, 
you know, black, indigenous, and Latinx, and Asian heritage people as minorities. Like, that's a, that's, that's a residual of white supremacy in language. And I'm not saying this to be prescriptive. I mean, BIPOC is a fine term. I, I don't mind being called part of the BIPOC community. I'm saying it to invite us to think about how language is shaping how we see people. And when we use words like minority, it's like, are you talking about the local minority? Or, like, what are you talking, what are we talking about, right? Because sometimes we minoritize people by calling them minorities, right? Play, paying attention to those things. Um, and also, I like global using people of the global majority because it steps out of the language of colonizers and enslavers who label people by color and said, the closer you are to whiteness, the better. And, and also, color is a misnomer. It's inaccurate. Every color and phenotype is represented in every ethnicity. So for so many reasons, the language is just is, is, is problematic. So one of the ways that I've learned to work with this is to you know in, invite people to share with me how they identify, or if they identify, not only around ethnicity, uh, but and other areas as well. So yeah, here's another quote from Glissant. I just want you to feel a little inspired, so I'm moving around. Um, he talks about how we know ourselves as part and in crowd. Again, this relational piece, right? And in an unknown that does not terrify, right? Not feeling like we have to just know everything. It has to be right. Um, you know, Dr. Murphy Shigematsu was asked a question recently about, you know, how do you measure it? And it's like, <laughs> you know, that may not be, that might not apply to the most vast aspects of our experience, right? The way to engage the most meaningful and vast aspects of our being and of our interbeing might not be to measure them. You know, it might be something else, or that might be a part of it, right? And we want to attend it with other things. So, you know, that vast unknown that does not terrify and crying a cry of poetry, having these open boats that sail for everyone. I love that. Invitation for you to kind of contemplate, play with, because my hope, my aspiration for all of us is that we continue to cultivate Elan Vital, cultivate joie de vivre, cultivate some, you know, internal purpose as well as interpersonal um, purpose, relational purpose. Um, so, you know, study, st expanding our notion of studying and what is studying. Uh, this is Fred Moten. If you are not familiar with Fred Moten and Stefano Har Harvey and the whole undercommons, that's a whole realm worthy of investigation. He says, we're committed to the idea that study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people and working and dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. The notion of a rehearsal, being in a kind of workshop, playing in a band, in a jam session, or old men sitting on a porch, or people working together in a factory, these, there are these various modes of activity. The point of calling it study is to mark that the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities is already present. Science doesn't just happen in, you know, in academic context and amongst those who are degreed. So by way of closing, or with my last five minutes, I'd like to invite you to consider this. What, what if your hypothesis of your research was a poem? You know, what if your research was a melody? You know, what if your teaching was a movement? You know, how, how can we, we all have much, so much interdisciplinary knowledge and yet we silo those, those learnings and those experiences from our scientific inquiry. So let's play, right? Because play is an important way and a valuable way that the, the mind learns to do things. So you can just take out a piece of paper or use your pen, make a poem. I want you to make a poem about your research, okay? Or about your study, about your inquiry, whatever you're into. And it's free association. Do not try to make it right or censor yourself, right? So you're gonna fill in the blanks. Science is some kind of natural element. And teaching droops, slides, as I study some kind of sound, and then research imbues me with what scent. 
Just free associate with it and see what comes up. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just going to show you what's in your stream of consciousness and what embodied, natural, scent experiences you have when you think about your work. So, you know, anybody want to, in like 10 seconds, share what they came up with? Hell no is the answer to that. <laughs> oh, yes, great. Brave soul right there. Please, go ahead. Oh, yes, give her the mic. I associated it. I don't know if it's possible. I said, this is not possible. I'm happy to cede some of my time to be a little interactive. Science is chocolate. Is that a natural element? Say it again. <laughs> Science <laughs> is chocolate. And teaching blossoms, as I study bells, research imbues me with orange blossoms. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> And keep doing it. Everybody do it every day. Get your Elan Vital back. Make your make yourself make your study, your inquiry a poem every day, a little haiku. You know, like to be in that love affair relationship with our work and our it's just so enriching. I love this piece about being a subversive intellectual because I feel like it really describes me. And it describes how to have Elan Vital. Uh, you know, just enjoying the ride, wanting it to be faster and wilder, not ordered. I don't want a room of my own. I want to be in the world, and I want to be with others, making the world an, anew. You know, and I love this part, too. Uh, came under false pretenses, like I didn't come here to just get degrees and get prestige, like what you think you come here for with bad documents, like, you know what I mean? Like taking apart that notion that certain kinds of documents are more valuable, right? Where's the degree from? Out of love, to let that deep compassion be the motivator, you know? Her labor is as necessary as it is unwelcome. The university needs it. The university needs what she bears, but cannot bear what she brings. And on top of that, on top of all that, she disappears. And I love that part. Cliff and I were talking yesterday. He was talking about this, uh, this contemplative who offered some notion on bearing and the unbearable, and that a different way to think about bearing the unbearable is that it motivates us to change the circumstances of the world so that no one must bear this thing, right? So I, I really invite us all to think about that, and I will stop there with my deepest, deepest gratitude. Here's a QR code. Here's how to reach me. Let's keep talking and stay connected and be do beautiful work together. Thank you. So we will keep Should talking, yeah, oh, because okay. now we, because thank you for that extraordinary offering. Thank you. Thank you for creating the conditions. So we now have the opportunity to continue the poetic dialogue, <laughs> um, because we have 10 minutes for questions for Camila. Yes, and from comments, the Zoom folks, too. And from too. the Zoom folks and from folks in the room. So do I see someone who... And if you just want to say your poem, that's OK, too, you know? <laughs> do I see any, any takers in the room? Or if not, we'll go to the, to the Zoom. Yes, we. Cliff, I got it. You get to keep your mic since you're the moderator. Oh. oh okay. <laughs> Don't take my job, man. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Dr. Mochi. That was beautiful. I love so much of what you had, and I love all the quotes and the poems. It's just so magical. And so, um, so much of what you mentioned really stands out to me. Um, when, I, when I hear about your your way and your lens of seeing things, it reminds me of like queer theory. And queer mm -hmm. theory is so much about, right, like seeing things in a radically different way, right? And so, you just gave the example of maybe putting your hypothesis in like a poem, right? Um, I'm curious, what other ways could we change our research to, I don't know, like just ideas that maybe you've even had, just like when it comes to measuring things or um, expressing our things in our discussion or, you know, things like that in research. Um, have you had any other ideas of ways that we can transform that and make it more just different, you know, and inclusive, like things like that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of the things we did during the contemplative coping um, with COVID 
early days was we started to have um, what we called support and information sessions, right? And we were seeking support from people who would be our participants, right? So again, we don't know everything, including we don't know the right questions, right? Like, just to start, start with the assumption that you don't know the, you have a question, but it might not be the question, right? Or you have some questions, but they might not be all the questions. And how those questions get framed is, it's a great thing to be in conversation with the people who are the stakeholders about, right? So if I'm, I'm doing, like I was doing my research with, you know, queer folks, right? So I, I went and spoke with us, right? So in, in other people who, for example, identified as black and queer. So when I'm in South Africa, they're like, oh, okay, well, these are the words for that, and these are those words don't fit here, so why don't you change this part of the survey to say that? And I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? It was such a, an important learning experience in terms of you know, expanding my own conceptualization and getting more authentic responses. So that's, that's one example to kind of be engaged with the people who, uh, who who we are in the co-investigative experience with, right? And to understand ourselves to be being investigated to, and to, to be as, as surrendered, to surrender to that in a way that allows ourselves to grow from the input of the people who we are studying. Yeah, I love that, thank you so much. That's oh, just a wonderful you. concept, thank you. Do we have a question from Zoom? Yes. yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, hi there, and, and um, thank you so much, Dr. Majid. I hope I pronounced that correctly. You did. Um, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, my name is Rose, and I'm a meditation trainer and coach. And I just found this extraordinarily eye, ear, and soul opening and fascinating. And the first thing that came to me, because I have a, you know, I actually got a master's degree in wildlands ecology at Davis decades ago. So that's sort of a, a big science is a big, big interest to me. Um, when you first started mentioning these features of white supremacy, such as, you know, making it an individual pursuit, um, the urgency, this thing of, you know, hurry up and, you know, and I could readily see the ramifications and implications of that as, as a supremacist. What I would love to know and what I would like to deep in, uh, deep, dig into deep more deeply if possible, if I can say that, is, is there any research that you would suggest to, to that one could um, delve into to learn more about this? Because I those things just wouldn't have come to mind to me as white supremacists, but it makes sense. So I was wondering if that's something that you have come up with in your own research or your own concept with your background or, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. It, it does make sense. If I understand you correctly, it sounds like you're asking, has there been research on <laughs> almost research on the white gaze, which, of course, not only white people have. Anybody who's been in, educated in, you know, in Western education has, you know, been imbued with this kind of perspective. So, uh, no, th there's not a lot of research on uh, implementing or, or actualizing a different, uh, a more inclusive perspective that deliberately targets the characteristics of white supremacy that I talked about. Mm -hmm. That said, there is research that um, looks at researchers who try to take a more inclusive and uh, a more inclusive lens. And that research talks about how the, re the researcher has a more fulfilling experience and that the participants feel more engaged, they feel like it's more meaningful, like they get more out of it than a stipend, right? And that's another piece to think about uh, when, mm -hmm. you know, when we're doing research, when we're working with people in the co, when we're experiencing people in the co-investigative process, you know, what's, what is the mutual, what's my aspiration for the mutual benefit, right? What's, what's that? Because again, that, that's a source of joy and, you know, to be able to, to even aspire towards that and strive towards that, especially in a collaborative way. Thank you. Thank you. Do we, we have a, I, I saw a hand back. I will bring it on over. 
you get the luxury of holding on to your mic as the moderator. <laughs> so many microphones. It's good. It's good that we have them. Hi, my name Hi. is Kate. I feel a little tentative. I'm not an actual academic. Um, oh. I've infiltrated from the community. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do work in schools. Mm -hmm. I work in our local school district on school climate, on social climate. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to offer what I think is an example, a COVID-based example, of a place where we were doing sort of action research, maybe, but Wonderful. also. Um, so we know we don't do as well by our Spanish-speaking students and families as we do by our English-speaking students and families, by our multilingual families as well as we do by our monolingual families. And so during COVID, we were all struggling to stay connected. Uh, the director of multilingual programs and I started a group on Friday afternoons for any staff to, um, connected with Spanish-speaking students and families. And we, we had an hour on Zoom, right? We're all at home. And what that began as was it, the intention was to learn, but it was also to create a, 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 a place of support and um, connection in the midst of all this disconnection. And so we would spend sometimes half that meeting on checking in with each other, sometimes more. That that, that meeting went from a, a check-in, and it had a closing at the end. But the business in the middle, which were announcements and questions and curiosities and things we were seeing because of our unique points of access to this community, um, became the most productive working group I've ever been a part of. And it continues. It's at, it actually starts at two, um, so I'm going to duck out. But, <laughs> but it literally, we would, people will come off vacation to come to that Wonderful. group. Wonderful. But we know each other's lives, and we know each other's students, and out of that have come our language justice coordinator position and, and new programs and new activities. But it was built out of the love we were having for each other as colleagues getting through COVID. And I think that intensity helped make our work more effective and intense too. Absolutely. So yeah. Just and the that as a Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I'm so glad that you're here. You know, I'm so glad that everybody's here from all the different realms and experiences that we come from. And, you know, it's community and, and dialogue, right? Like I think a lot and talk a lot about contemplative dialogue as being a way of inquiry. So with other people who uh, you know, are, are trying to do your, your endeavor, whether it's a particular research project or a teaching project or some kind of learning project, and also consulting with people or being in dialogue with people who think very specifically about inclusivity, which is something I, I did I do when I'm doing live research, you know, and something I do with other folks because there's a, a way sometimes it's hard to see what you don't see. So, you know, bring somebody on the team who's not so immersed in the, you know, in the granular aspects of it for them to zoom out and say, where, you know, where's white supremacy? It's in here somewhere. Can you help me find it? You know, where is it? Is it in my syllabi? Is it in my curriculum? You know, where is it? Is it in my design? Right? Because you, you can't, we can't do it alone. We really do need someone to help us uh, do that. So I, I'm so happy that you're already doing that in community. And I really encourage everyone to do it. I'm not the only person who does that. There are many or a few you know, folks that I know of who really help people think about how to make their work, their teaching more inclusive. And it's a, it's a gift that we can give to one another to transform science in the academy. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so it's now my pleasure to uh, bring into the room Dr. Lawrence Kermeyer, who is joining us from McGill University, who is going to give a talk on uh, mindfulness in a multicultural context. And there is Lawrence. It's so good to see you. All right, super. Okay, well, I'm just delighted. I, I mean, I'm not delighted that I'm not there. I was hoping to be there. As, as Cliff knows, I actually spent three years uh, in, in Sacramento at UC Davis at the Medical Center doing my residency in psychiatry from 1978 to 81. And although I've been back a few times, I was hoping that this was going to be a little uh, you know, chance to visit and meet uh, old friends and, and hang out a little bit. But that's not what happened for a variety of reasons. So I'm still glad I'm able to be with you online and especially to follow these two talks, because in a very strange way, as you'll see in a moment, 
Uh, my talk is situated somewhere between these two uh, talks, and you're going to see uh, uh, perhaps a surprising number of resonances with some different aspects of what people were just talking about. Uh, it's not exactly what uh, Cliff just billed it as, in that I'm not going to be emphasizing multiculturalism or cultural difference per se, uh, but rather the more um, underlying issues that have to do with how we think about context, and that includes cultural context and social context and real world context. Uh, so uh, we will definitely be dealing with culture. And since I'm talking about context, uh, let me begin by acknowledging part of my context, uh, which is that I'm living on unceded land uh, of uh, Indigenous peoples here in Canada. 5% of the Canadian population are Indigenous, and Canada had a state-organized policy of cultural genocide for 100-plus years. So we're in a process of reconciliation right now, and part of that is to do certain acknowledgments, which we hope are not purely performative, but actually are a moment uh, of reflection and of acknowledgement. So I'm just acknowledging that uh, I'm McGill University, and indeed the, my home where I'm sitting right now, uh, are on uh, land of the Haudenosaunee and uh, uh, Anishinaabeg peoples. Uh, and um, um, those are communities that are actually very active and active in, in contributing to the McGill community life as well as their own um, uh, communities. So that's a little part of my context. Another part of my context is that I direct a program at McGill that goes back to the 1950s that is the oldest program in the world devoted to cultural psychiatry. And the idea of cultural psychiatry is really to acknowledge that we are cultural beings. And if we're trying to think about mental health, about me mental suffering, about solutions to that, we need to be thinking about that in relation to cultural context, that we can't automatically assume that by virtue of our specific cultures or languages, we have access to everything we need to know. We need to be learning from each other and from the great diversity that exists around the world, not only to respond appropriately to people in terms of what they need, but to enrich our own ideas of what, what's going on in, in human experience and human consciousness. So having said that, uh, we're very interested in cultural psychiatry and, you know, exploring and, and, and connecting with other people. One place that I've done some work with colleagues, uh, both research work and training work, working with uh, mental health professionals, uh, is uh, Nepal. Here's uh, the great stupa in uh, Bodhnath. Uh, and um, that is an exotic, for, for a North American, for somebody who, like me, who was born and grew up in Montreal, uh, that's an exotic place to go, and culture seems very obvious and very all, all about. Uh, and we can look at people's practices and be fascinated by them and captivated by the aesthetics. And in the process, it's easy to forget that we are also living in exotic contexts. Um, this is the interior of a building not very far from where I am. This is what it looks like on the outside in the springtime. And this is a... Um, um, uh, a large church that is a site of pilgrimage for people throughout uh, New England and uh, in Eastern Canada. And inside you will find the crutches of many people who were healed by uh, coming to visit uh, that place. So we are dealing with environments where the background that we take for granted is itself very cultural, very historical, very rooted in particular ways of doing things that we ought to be curious about. And in particular, we ought to be curious about them, not only because it's part of what we're taking for granted, what's our background knowledge, but because um, to encounter other people, to make sense of what going on for them, we have to become self-aware, self-reflective, and to some degree bracket uh, those differences. Um, so having said that, let me say just a, a word then about the, the kind of um, uh, work that we do, the kind of context, um, which is uh, partly a research context and partly a clinical context. That is that we're uh, working in the area of training health professionals and mental health professionals. And so we're interested in how can we equip um, helpers to be more responsive to the realities of the diverse people uh, that they're working with. Um, and these books that I'm, I'm sort of showing at the moment represent some chapters in that work. Uh, uh, a study some time ago 
with um, uh, or, or a conference some time ago with the Foundation for Psychocultural Research that's based at UCLA under the direction of Rob Lemelson on trauma, where we tried to bring together very different perspectives to think about trauma uh, and including anthropological perspectives as well as clinical and, uh, and neuroscience perspectives. Uh, a more recent uh, conference on thinking about psychiatry from that point of view, and then our own work in developing a clinical service that tries to contextualize people's problems in relation to their cultural backgrounds. So this is all about context, all of these things that we're talking about. And I'm gonna be alluding to some of those um, experiences and some of the tools that we use for that. Um, and, uh, but, but I wanted to address really some very basic questions that have been raised here today. Uh, and this most recent book, uh, again, coming from the same uh, um, interdisciplinary program and support that tries to bring together contemporary neuroscience with um, anthropology and with um, uh, some philosophical perspectives to think through the ways in which uh, culture, mind, and brain co-construct each other. And so um, before I launch into the discussion of contemplative science per se, I, I'm, I'm talking about things that are quite general. And the point of this slide is to remind us that human biology and the human brain uh, is about coevolution between our bodies and brains and a culturally constructed world. We live in niches and in groups that, that we ourselves are shaping and constructing through our cultural practices. So we have this sort of coevolutionary process occurring on or, or co constructive process occurring on multiple timescales. And that's going to be very re uh, relevant for our whole discussion. So just to um, reinforce a couple of points that were made earlier uh, today, um, uh, there was a discussion at one point about some of the cultural biases that are built into our psychology, uh, uh, into our, um, uh, our uh, clinical practices, uh, and those um, stem from uh, a kind of what we can call a cultural concept of the person is a term that the sociologist Marcel Moss, hang on a second here, what's happening here? Oh, I don't know why. I keep getting this little reminder here that I don't want to have to deal with. Why is it doing that? Hmm. Yeah, I don't, okay, I think what I can do, sorry, oh, you'll quit my email and maybe it'll stop asking me to do that. So sorry. Hopefully that's going to make a difference. Um, so, uh, most of our psychology is underwritten by uh, what we could call an individualistic perspective that understands where all the action is for human beings is in their own, uh, in our brains, in our individual uh, 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 positions and experiences. But as was mentioned earlier, for most of the world, uh, the way of thinking about the person from the get-go is more relational. The people are understood as being embedded in a network of relationships, as being constituted by those relationships, those interdependencies. Uh, and there are other ways of thinking about the person as well. So uh, I, some of my work has been with Indigenous peoples in Canada, and for some of those communities, the notion um, of the person is very much tied to relationships to place and to land and to non-human beings, the notion that there's uh, a kind of um, back and forth uh, between uh, the human and what is not strictly human, but still constitutive of us in particular ways. And there are uh, other ways of thinking that are very common around the world and very important for how people make sense of themselves that have to do with what we could call the cosmocentric view, a notion that there is another dimension or aspect to experience that might be invisible, uh, that might involve ancestors or spirits or other beings, and that those are intrinsic to people. We all have aspects of these different ways of thinking in different domains in our life. But what's important for us uh, coming at this from the point of view of um, academic psychology and uh, various scientific research enterprises is how we have not given uh, much emphasis on to these other uh, aspects of the self, other ways of thinking about self-experience. And uh, as you'll see in a moment, those become quite important for making sense of what's going on for human beings in various practices. So that was all by way of preamble, really, of saying, where do we start from coming at this from a cultural psychiatric point of view? We take for granted that there are a lot of assumptions built into our models that we want to become self-critical and self-reflective and create a space 
to pay attention to differences and to learn from them in some ways so that we can respond appropriately to people and, and so that we can enlarge and deepen our, our models of, of ourselves. And uh, that applies as much uh, just as well to any particular practice. So I'm going to be talking a little bit now about contemplative science and contemplative practice. So the question is, what is it we're studying? Uh, and I'll say a little bit about what we might mean by practices. Uh, and then I want to focus in on what social science has to offer. Um, a lot of my research uses the methods of anthropology, you, qualitative research, experience near uh, interviewing, ethnography, so paying attention to the li life worlds and contexts of people, uh, and try to use that to inform things that we then might do in a more structured way, uh, using self-report measures or, uh, or observations, and for that matter, using uh, uh, neurobiological measures, but trying always to start from uh, some kind of opening up onto the context and making sense of what's going on uh, from uh, the outsider's point of view, which is inevitably part of where all of us come from when we look at a new situation, but also from the insider's point of view uh, uh, by really having cl close partnerships and ongoing conversations with people who have uh, lived experiences deeply rooted in a particular uh, context. So I'm going to say a bit about that, and then I'm going to talk very briefly um, about uh, what uh, it, we think is a current uh, framework coming from cognitive science and coming from computational neuroscience that actually provides us with tools for bridging uh, the traditional concerns and interests of phenomenology, of humanities and so on, with the efforts in psychology and other disciplines to build process oriented models or mechanistic models, models that is that give us details of how things fit together and how they work, uh, which we hope are useful because they let us build things, I guess, as, as Yuri Hassan was just illustrating, but also because they give us a deeper understanding of what's going on and maybe a better ability to decide when and where we can generalize from some causal relationship that we, we think we understand. Uh, and as you'll see, as it turns out, uh, some of the same models that were just being talked about uh, may give us tools for including the social world and social context in a very rich way, ultimately, and in a way that allows us to bridge very different uh, paradigms and traditions, uh, which I think will be of great interest to, to, to all of us. And then finally, I'll be talking uh, about the implications of this for the politics and poetics uh, of experience very briefly, but picking up again on earlier themes today. So again, my I apologize that the slides are very word dense. There's lots of things on there. It's partly so you can read them while I'm talking if you take things in better that way. It's partly to remind me. But what I what I will say is that I'm happy to share these slides. So um, you know, don't worry about getting through all the, the verbiage on them. And in fact, I don't know how sharp and clear it is. It may not be that easy to read. So in any event, this slide tries to just say a few words about what do we mean by practices. Where you know, contemplative science is interested to some degree in a set of practices, and those are things, activities that are distinguished from everydayness in some ways, uh, in the sense that people set aside time place to try to do something and to do it repeatedly in some way following a kind of a script and there are a variety of goals for why people would do that to gain certain skills to get better at something to be to get so good at it that it becomes automatic and then you can do other things if you're a musician you learn to play more or less automatically and then you're free to focus on the interpretation on on putting nuance into what you're doing or listening to the other players if you're in a improvising jazz uh, uh, trio then you're free to pay to really be mainly listening to other people and incorporating what they're saying into what you're doing with a certain degree of highly practiced, almost uh, automaticity, at least the components of what you're doing. Um, there's also, uh, though, uh, ways in which we practice, and certainly this is very relevant to contemplative practice, to get knowledge, to get insight, to change the way we view the world. Uh, we do practices to position ourselves in a different way. If I've practiced a lot, I have a certain social status as uh, an expert in something and so on. Uh, and we also use that to create uh, social roles and positions and reproduce society. Uh, and um, But in the case of contemplative practices, I think there is an interest in many cases in getting some kind of moral or ethical or, uh, or a soteriological benefit in the sense of trying to have a measure of moving beyond uh, the the limitations and the the uh, deep dilemmas uh, of our predicament. So that's something perhaps special about what we call uh, contemplative practices that we need to think about. Um, so 
Uh, this comes out of a discussion, this slide and some of the points on this with uh, Michael Sheehy and John Dunn and others around practices and contemplated practices again sponsored at a workshop by the Foundation for Psychocultural Research. And so these are uh, partly their words and a few of mine. So, first of all, acknowledging that we're talking about many different practices, although many of us have spent some time and have some specific interest in Buddhist uh, practices, even Buddhism, of course, uh, itself includes many, many different uh, strands and traditions and approaches. Uh, but there are many other spiritual traditions and practices that um, uh, also count as contemplative practices and that other people are interested in, in understanding analogies and differences uh, among these. Um, in this case, we're interested in things that have a lot to do with, or at least begin with, uh, training attention in some way. So one can learn to be attentive uh, in a particular way and with particular constancy and so on, that that it may enable certain kinds of insights and understandings, uh, that uh, one follows a set of instructions to get started, uh, that there are way stations along the way that uh, give us some indication or others can help us see whether we're making progress or what to do next uh, to move this along. Uh, and that often involves a, a community, it involves a teacher, involves a community, other people who help to make sense of our experience. So from a, a, a I guess, anthropological point of view, we would have to say that these practices that we're describing are fundamentally social practices. Uh, that is, they, uh, they may make use of very basic properties or qualities of, of the human uh, being, uh, but they begin with a kind of set of expectations, with a narrative, with a, a possibility of what uh, what one could gain from this and where one might be going and so on. And we're gonna, I'm going to argue as we go along that that's not at all incidental to the practices. Even if the practices sometimes portray themselves as presenting something that is not dependent on those frames, um, there's every reason to think that those frames are important, are part of who we are and a part of where we're going. Okay, um, so I've already alluded to what I think social science can offer this kind of, uh, you know, contemplative science uh, work, understanding practices as something that occur in social context, having languages and ways of thinking about what is that context, what, what characterizes a context, and to what extent do the context we're describing have their own dynamics that are not incidental to the dynamics of the person, of, the, of their psychology, of the brain, of the body, and so on. And we're, again, we'll come back to this, but the essential view that, um, that comes out of the sort of four e cognitive science that I'll be talking about is that we are constituted not just by our brains, but by our engagements with the environment. Uh, and that that's, uh, you know, uh, part of who we are, part of what we're about. Um, at the same time, by looking at context as such, and by looking at it in a comparative way, social science offers us perspective or frameworks for comparative study and for critique. Uh, one of the dilemmas we have of, since we all grow up within and live within, work within a particular context, is that we're all operating most of the time with tacit background knowledge, with implicit assumptions, with notions of common sense, with, with things that are just, that's the way it is. Uh, and um, um, by beginning to encounter different worlds of experience and having um, uh, dialogue and, and systematic inquiry, we can begin to understand the assumptions that are being built into what we're doing and throw those into relief and ask questions about how they're functioning uh, and how they contribute to, to our experience in some ways. And this ultimately is not only an issue for doing better science, let's say, or but also an ethical issue for understanding uh, what we're doing uh, uh, consciously or inadvertently, uh, to what extent we're doing, uh, as my colleague Joe Gon likes to say, cultural proselytization uh, or making uh, value judgments without reflecting on them because of the framework that we're operating from within. So I want to say a few more specific words then about how we could think about contemplative practice in context. And I'm going to say, uh, talk about this from three kinds of contexts. Uh, one context that we could say is the context of attention, attentional mechanisms. How do we pay attention to something? Where does that come from? How does that become socially and culturally shaped and entrained? And uh, how does that change our experience? Uh, the second contextual level, I would say, is more interactional and intersubjective. How do we uh, make sense of our experience? How do we communicate it to others? How do they uh, 
uh, shape our experience. Very, as you I hear, you hope you're already hearing all the many echoes to all the talks today, but in this regard, specifically to Yuri Hassan's uh, talk that you, you just heard. And then also related to that, the third context will be the larger narrative frames or discursive uh, practices that we're embedded in. That is, we, uh, starting from infancy, don't perceive the world uh, as um, uh, a blank slate that we have to figure out entirely for ourselves. Everything that we do is presented to us in a particular frame, often accompanied by language or by other kinds of symbolic markers that help us to make sense of it and uh, with which um, it then becomes imbued. So we need to make sense uh, of that. Uh, so attention-wise, if we think, this is a, a slide from a, a paper many years ago on talking about hypnosis and dissociation, just to acknowledge that every day, the phenomenology of everyday experience is quite complicated. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of states of mind or modes of engaging the world. Here's a picture of four of them, uh, or four sets of them. They're not discrete things themselves. Uh, uh, a lot of premium, and especially in individualistic cultures where people are asked to give a narrative of self, a lot of uh, priority and emphasis is put on a kind of self-consciousness where you're asked, what are you doing or what are you thinking? And you learn to give an account of that. And there are moments when we have that, you know, we're doing that in for ourselves privately. We're, we're thinking about who we are and what we're doing and where we're at. So we'll call that sort of self-consciousness and we can manipulate that and measure that. If I put a, a, a mirror in the room with you while you're filling out questionnaires, you'll use more first per person pronouns because the mirror has shifted your attention uh, toward your a sense of self in that regard. But a lot of the time we spend uh, not necessarily focused on ourselves, but just encountering experiences, sensory experiences in the world, other people. So we could view that as sort of other consciousness, other focused consciousness. We also spend a lot of time uh, in uh, reverie and fantasy and daydreaming and uh, mind wandering and exploring different imaginal worlds or constructions. Uh, uh, and that may occur in a way that's not very conscious. And then we have lots of mindless activity in the sense that there's a great deal of everyday activity, whether it's driving a car along a familiar route or going to the copy machine to make copies or uh, other kinds of things that are mindless in a sense, automatic, uh, you know, and some of those are subpersonal habitual things, but some are fairly complicated cognitive tasks. So, I mean, the point of this is just to say there is a complex phenomenology. It, uh, if you do experiential sampling where you beat people and ask them what they're doing, you find that they move in and out of different kinds of uh, states of mind and that those are all relevant to everyday functioning. How are we supposed to make sense of those? Currently in psychiatry and uh, psychology and neuroscience, uh, there's a notion that we are going to unpack these processes uh, by uh, looking at it as a multi-level process uh, and privileging, I guess you would say in recent neuroscience, uh, circuitry, brain circuitry. We're going to try to understand uh, the ways things are wired together and connected, and that that's going to help us understand the underlying processes. This is a, um, a diagram from a paper that just came out that talks about these different multi-level explanatory frameworks in psychiatry uh, and uh, talks about the problems uh, in applying them and argues for, as I'll be talking about in just a moment, uh, the utility of a cross-cutting set of concepts that come from contemporary cognitive science that you can see on the far right, which have to do with embodiment, enactment, and, and so on. Um, so um, I'm going to move along to that. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a, a, a diagram that, again, speaks to these levels that we were just talking about. At the top, you can see the sort of connectomics, the idea that you have different brain regions that are linked together. In the middle, you can see uh, more of a, uh, a neural tissue level where you can see uh, neural processing and, and layers uh, that could represent the kinds of uh, forward and back propagation that Uri Hassan was just talking about. How does the brain, how the neural networks of the brain look for patterns and, and process them? And below that, you can see more of the cellular, synaptic, and eventually the molecular level that, that's constitutive. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of interest right now in neuroscience represented in the research domain criteria hierarchy I just showed you from US NIMH in looking a lot at this level of the uh, the overall um, circuitry of the brain, the, the connectomics, but also in terms of computational modeling, a lot of, of interest in the possibilities of constructing models that are really about multi-layered neural networks uh, that can do the kinds of looking for statistical regularities and predicting uh, that uh, was just being talked about. 
What that uh, leaves out, however, and I think this is crucial for the, the kind of model building, the kind of making sense of a human practice that we want, want to do, is the fact that the, the tissue of the brain uh, exists in the context of the whole brain, and the brain exists in the context of the body, and the body exists in the context of relationships in the world, and our engagement with the world is pretty fundamental and quite extensive. It goes quite far, uh, not just from the immediate people we're in interaction with, or the computer screen, or the text that we have next to us, but with networks of people uh, and uh, who, that extend quite far, both spatially and in time. So we need a way of making sense of that, and the idea that perhaps our cognitive capacities and our experiential uh, processes are in fact uh, constituted by those kinds of uh, loops or circuits. And this uh, essential set of ideas that have grown up over the last uh, several decades uh, in, uh, in, in cognitive science, now called 4E cognitive science, uh, uh, because of these different components that people are thinking about, uh, is I think extremely useful when we're thinking about co uh, contemplative practice. And it's not accidental. Uh, this these perspectives to a significant degree have grown out of uh, neuroscientists and philosophers and others uh, explicitly interested in contemplative practices. Uh, so um, um, Francesco Varela, Evan Thompson, Eleanor Roche wrote an important book on the embodied mind. And there, uh, since then, we have generations almost of different layers of work in this kind of paradigm, extending it and developing it in ways that provide us with a set of conceptual tools and approaches that I think are extremely um, helpful and useful in thinking about uh, um, uh, contemplative uh, practices and, and, and phenomena. So I skipped ahead. So um, what it means for us in terms of, and I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by embodiment and enactment before uh, then coming around to the, the um, final set of points about thinking about contemplative practice. So here's a picture maybe of where experience comes from, sort of crudely, grosso modo. We have neurobiological processes, um, and those have some relationship to experience. Uh, and a lot of uh, effort in neuroscience goes on just trying to make sense of those correlations. It's very relevant clinically. If someone has a brain injury, there are changes in their experience, and we can make sense of them to some degree uh, based on our rough models of what might be going on. And we work the process both ways. We try to figure out uh, things about the brain on the basis of things like injury or stimulation or measuring activity and so on. Uh, but in reality, there is a larger context that that's embedded in, and that has to do with our own functionality, that we can uh, be engaging with ourselves, our bodies, and the world in different ways. So that's represented here by the box at the top that says attention and interpretation. Uh, so we are reacting to ourselves, and we are moving through the world in response to that, and we are um, uh, changing our own input on the basis of our behavior. So there is a kind of loop going on there that is part of the ordinary experience. Uh, and at the same time, what we're moving through is not a neutral environment. It's not uh, like a wa simply walking through a maze most of the time. Uh, it is a social world, a world uh, that is filled with other people, uh, with other people who are um, communicating with us in different ways, who have expectations, who matter to us in different ways, and so on. So that this kind of picture of multiple loops uh, and the kind of cyclical uh, pick, um, uh, relationships is essential to our understanding of what human cognition and function is like. And we've argued that if we want to make sense of that, we have to acknowledge the fact that the world comes to us, the worlds that we learn to navigate, that we adapt to, are fundamentally cultural. They're fundamentally shaped by history, by language, by expectations. Uh, and the first thing that we learn to do from infancy and that we continue to develop throughout our lives is how to attend to that world, what to pay attention to and what is, what's okay to ignore. Uh, what to, how to move around and position ourselves so we get the kind of information we need so that we can perform in the ways that we need. So um, in the middle here, you see these little um, uh, uh, stylized neurons, green and, and red neurons. And this is supposed to represent a couple of layers of a predictive processing network uh, to some degree of the kind that, that um, uh, Yuri Hassan was talking about. Uh, so you can imagine, in fact, many layers of that because the hierarchical processing in human beings is probably very deep and goes from basic sort of sensory expectations and motor uh, guidance to uh, intermediate models and to long range plans all in kind of an extended uh, hierarchy uh, to some degree. 
Uh, but you, what you can see are these two extra things here. So we, you can see that we have um, a situation where we are in an environment, this green box, that is presenting us with certain expectations and demands and, uh, uh, that are structuring what we have access to and what's expected from us. What is it we have to do? What, what, what is the, the point of our um, um, engaging with the world so that we can survive? Uh, and then you can see this yellow box, which also represents something that's culturally patterned, uh, that is telling us how to pay attention. And that comes both from the basic level of engagements with the world, but it can also come in at a higher level. That is, it can come in from dexis, from ostention. It can come in from a narrative structure that we acquire as we acquire more and more uh, representational structures so that we can learn to in forage for information or engage with the world in, in different ways. Um, that learning of different regimes uh, within different regimes of attention, how to pay attention to the world, how to pay attention to my body. You know, if I'm a child and I fall and I hurt myself, I may, I get a signal, a rough signal that's already there hardwired that this is an important event. I need to pay attention. So that's the pain signal, the, you know, crude pain signal that's there for adaptive reasons. But in reality, when a child has those experiences, they usually look around for someone, for a person who represents safety and care, and they look at the expression on that person's face or what they're saying, and that immediately begins to color and frame and change the nature of that experience. So that's an, we could say that there's a close analogy to that. And to me, sitting at the Insight Meditation Society with my knees hurting uh, and wondering what I'm supposed to do with this, and then getting uh, some advice from a teacher later on that I should just watch this and, and just notice it and just uh, you know, be curious about it, as was talked about earlier today. So that is now a narrative that's being installed at a higher level that is then governing my attention and my, my response. And so now I can have a different kind of experience. So you can see how this notion of regimes of attention, which is completely general and completely basic to uh, uh, cognitive development, uh, speaks very directly to particular kinds of um, 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 uh, contemplative practices and, and how they might be developed and how they might uh, teach us about the uh, the cyclical process. Now, from a cultural point of view, it's important to recognize again that this, this process is embedded in larger structures, structures that are both social arrangements, but also historical arrangements. So the language that we use, the metaphors that are available to us and so on, all have a history and they're all related to a certain set of assumptions. So they begin to color and shape our experience. And that shaping occurs not as an afterthought, uh, although initially it may be a very high level prior that's influencing what's going on. It will change the tuning of lower levels of processing. So eventually we will come to engage with something in a particular way, with a particular bodily habitus, with a particular set of expectations. So I'm describing to you a way of thinking about how we become encultured uh, that I think has a lot of utility for thinking about uh, uh, um, uh, contemplative practices, and that suggests that, in fact, uh, the narratives we have about ourselves, about experience and so on, the philosophical systems, the moral systems, the everyday ways of learning to talk about ourselves are not incidental to the way we then experience the world uh, and the way we make sense of it. Uh, and those narratives have causal efficacy. Uh, they change the nature of our experience in ways uh, and uh, it's a more than a moot point as to whether if we didn't have any of those, we would have anything like the kind of experience that we have, because the depth of processing and the, and the predictive capacities we have depend exactly on these larger order structures that tell us something about how our worlds are structured, particularly how our social worlds are structured. That is what we can expect from other people, what, what we need to do to survive in, in a social context. So we can use this view to begin to think about basic practices, thinking about a practice, let's say, of doing prostrations or, or of uh, kneeling in prayer and recognize that in those processes, we have a link between an embodied level of experience that has physiological concomitants and uh, cognitive concomitants because of a change in posture, uh, an interpersonal level in which this has meaning to other people, and a larger cultural discursive level in which uh, uh, another level of meaning is in play. And these relationships precede us, that as we enter into them, they have a history and they shape our experience, and we in turn can contribute to them through our social practices. That applies not only to uh, symbolic action like sitting or standing, but 
but also to uh, the actual texture of our ex of experience, to temporal experience, for example. And I won't belabor it here, but just to say that the study of trauma shows ways in which temporal experience is drastically altered, not just by the hard wiring of how we remember something that's uh, you know very frightening or very painful, but by the overarching narratives of what we're told we should remember, we should be able to remember, what we're allowed to talk about or not allowed to talk about, and so on. Uh, so we've argued that all of this developmental process has to be understood in relationship to a set of what we could call cultural affordances. That is, the social world comes already patterned to us in a way that is full of cultural meaning. And that world is largely constructed with and by other people. So in fact, we are not just thinking through the kind of sensory motor affordances that J.J. Um, uh, Gibson talked about in his uh, theory of perception, uh, but actually cultural affordances that are constituted by other people. And this is a paper written with Carl Friston, one of the um, you know, very influential uh, thinkers in computational neuroscience, uh, who's advanced uh, sort of a paradigm of active inference that's not uh, cl close to what uh, Yuri Hassan was just talking about. Uh, and we've suggested that that same model that looks at how we learn to predict the world is being used to predict each other. Uh, and so we are in these loops with other people. Again, we've, this has been just illustrated very elegantly earlier. And, I, and the reason, I, as I say, it's kind of exciting for me is because we've made this argument not specifically to um, solve a, a problem at the level of uh, individual neuroprocessing, but to understand and provide a, a language that can link uh, the primacy of the social world uh, in human cognition uh, with our attempts to develop you know, basic models of how it is that people make sense uh, of the world. Uh, so we want the implication is that what we're calling thinking and cognition and so on is not just occurring inside the head. It's occurring in loops that take us through the world. There are different paths through the world. Uh, in the process, we lay down a trace. So certain paths become uh, more common. They, they're, they uh, meaning uh, uh, it, it accrues to them, and we are more likely to follow that path. But it also that world also has its own dynamics. It's not made of passive actors. It's made uh, of other people. And we can use that to begin to understand what might be going on. So we can use this model I just described, for example, to think about what goes on when somebody does a med meditative practice and they get into trouble. Not everybody who does meditative practices has a great time. Sometimes people, particularly people who go off and do it very intensive retreats without proper supervision, uh, can get into trouble, whether because they were already in a precarious state or because a very tight loop has been created uh, between a particular narrative, which might be you know, a narrative they have about their own vulnerability or anxiety or past experiences that they've been trying not to think about. Uh, and that becomes part of a way of attending to the body and the body responds to that sense of danger with uh, with um, alarm and a person gets caught in a kind of loop. That loop might look like a panic attack. It might look like hypochondriasis. It might look like a prolonged state of depersonalization, derealization, which the person feels really Things are not real, they're not present anymore in a way that is extremely distressing and dysfunctional for them. So first off, that, that understanding those kinds of loops, the idea that our sense of self and our sense of agency is not a static thing that gets installed at a certain point in development and then we're done. It's constantly being maintained and reinforced by our modes of engagement with the world. And if those modes change, if we're told, okay, don't talk to anybody else right now, sit here and just pay attention to your body and wait for this thing to happen, for some people, the thing that happens is not exactly what they were hoping for or banking on. And because there's nothing else there to correct them at that point, there's no one else to say, hey, let's go for a walk or let's do something different or you know, help to break them out of that cycle. They get lost in that cycle in some ways and it's self-perpetuating. So that's an inter more or less internal process. Although again, the seeds for that were set you know, by external circumstances. But those loops that we're talking about can also happen interpersonally. They can also happen socially. So we've been trying to build up this view and what we call an cultural eco-social view that says that the human mind and human experience is fundamentally ecological. It depends on the environment as much as it does on our brain. That environment, of course, it consists of other people and people are uh, you know, cultural beings. We are, our brains are wired by our particular cultural experiences. Someone asked earlier, you know, about learning a language later. You you start learning a language in utero. You, your brain starts getting pruned so that certain phonemes are easy to hear and other phonemes are not easy to hear. And as a result, for most of us, we learn a language later in life. We learn it with an accent uh, because there have been some 
you know, changes to our, our neural processing that makes it quite hard uh, to recognize and to produce those precise phonemes later on in life. That's a crude example, but striking example of, again, how we're being shaped by culture. Uh, and language, of course, shapes us in many uh, more profound ways in terms of uh, the sense we make uh, of the world. Uh, what this means for contemplative science. So we need to understand the contemplative practices as technologies that uh, through which we try to change ourselves to, to uh, you know, for the better, uh, understand ourselves, be uh, true to certain values and aspirations uh, that we have. They are also forms of life. That is, they're not just something that resides within the person. They're something that resides in a community, in, re in relationships, in our relationships to, to the body, to the environment, to social institutions. And therefore, we need to understand those contexts just uh, as much as we understand whatever's going on in the brain as somebody learns a, a new way of, um, uh, of being uh, and, and functioning. Um, and what that means for research is we should be looking not just at um, self-reports from the person uh, or um, things we can measure in their brain. We should be looking at the context they're in. Uh, we should understand a self-report as something that is not a simple readout of what's going on inside, but as a narrative that responds to expectations, uh, to, to styles of conversation, to styles of self-reflection that um, may have a, a, a long history, either within a tradition or in a particular person's life or somewhere at the intersection of those. Uh, and that will open us to both a better way to characterize what the processes are that we're trying to understand, but also give us some tools to be, uh, begin to understand what can go wrong, what can go wrong in terms of just how somebody gets into a practice that's not helping them, uh, but also what can go wrong institutionally, what can happen with a practice, let's say, that appeals to people and appeals, you know, serves a certain function, but maybe does not have the goals that were, in, uh, uh, you know, originally intended. Uh, and this is important because um, to some degree, the adoption of different uh, contemplative practices, and this was alluded to earlier in the discussion I mentioned of Buddhist modernism, uh, to some extent, uh, this is involved uh, taking traditions and taking practices that meant one thing at one moment in time and one place and generalizing them or abstracting them or adapting them to a somewhat different context. And you, we can argue that there are universal features of the human condition, existential dilemmas of mortality, of suffering, of death, and so on, that are you know, universal with us, perhaps will always be with us, and, and are constitutive of who we are. So therefore, traditions that try to help us come to terms with that are giving us very general answers. But if you look at how those traditions are actually framed at the language in which they're presented, it's clear that the the solution that's being offered is a solution that is targeted toward a particular moment in time, toward a particular social and political situation, for example. Uh, so uh, the effort to break out of oppressive hierarchies, let's say, which is, again, perhaps a universal human need to some degree, but it's, it's framed in a certain way that represents particular uh, forms of oppression, particular social situations. So we can ask to ourselves then, so what are the preeminent challenges of our moment that we people are turning to contemplative practices to solve? Again, they're the universal ones of pain and suffering and death, but there are particular things that we're facing right now that are shaping the ways that this uh, discussion is going on, the ways that people are uh, uh, developing uh, practices and, uh, and understanding them that we should be paying attention to. And this, again, is where I think a social science perspective, philosophical perspectives can be extremely helpful to help us, and comparative perspectives to help us articulate what these these um, unique features are. And I've just mentioned four of them here. I think this maybe anticipates some of what will be talked about in the next session. Uh, we've already talked about modernity and urbanization, secularism, and individualism, and how much that is under uh, our the psych psychological disciplines, uh, psychotherapy, psychiatry, and so on, are underwritten by particular notion of the person uh, that contains within it both liberatory and oppressive elements, and we need to be sorting those out in some ways. Uh, the second thing I have here is the, the whole situation of, of globalization. So we have a circulation of things that's wonderful, but also a commodification of them a and uh, an approach to uh, uh, taking on board new knowledges and so on that creates 
uh, its own vicious circles. And we live in a world of really growing inequality, unfortunately, at, at the present time, uh, enormously, enormous concentrations of wealth and tiny numbers of people and so on. And we should certainly be asking when we talk about practices that are being done in certain places and people have the time and energy to do them, whether there isn't some kind of um, problem built into that, that scenario that we should be thinking hard about. Uh, and then I've mentioned uh, these, uh, perhaps the these last two, which are very topical, uh, you know, the fact that we're now living in a wired world in some ways, and their virtues, I'm glad I'm able to be with you today without adding to global warming, that's a good thing. Uh, but we're all bombarded, you know, by too much uh, stimulation, by uh, hyper connectivity, and by uh, connections that occur in a very accelerated way. I, I know I've been talking a mile a minute here, but I have to say, because I just want to at least touch on all these points, but I but I really appreciate uh, Cliff's efforts to just sort of slow down for a moment and you know be in the present. It's so much a push pushing back against the way certainly that my life is most of the time, and I think for many of us that we have so many pressures that keep us going faster and faster. And finally, I've already alluded to global warming. I mean, I think there's an overwhelming uh, reality that we're facing, which is due to our acceleration, our growth, our expansion, whatever we're you know, we're burning up the planet at the moment. Uh, and we really need to be thinking about different ways uh, of living that are not, you know, we, we hear constantly about growth and growing the economy and so on. And this is just a non-starter. We have to be thinking about how to be in a steady state and have a good life in a steady state. And maybe this is where contemplative practices, along with artistic practices and other things, are going to be a big part of the answer in terms of having more quality of life rather than just simply having more of more. Uh, so my last slide uh, is, uh, you know, in honor of uh, Edouard Glissant, also one of my uh, touchstones, uh, someone who uh, also came from Martinique, as did Frantz Fanon, but ha had um, perhaps a more uh, a, a point of view more apposite for the present moment, which was that the the intermixing of cultures, the collision of different cultural points of view, is a fundamental source of creativity of creating new things. Uh, and this is the driver of, of human uh, diversity and, and complexity. And so uh, encountering the other and respecting people as different, as same and different, uh, is a tremendous source of, of new ideas and new possibilities. And it's my hope that, you know, that's part of this conversation that we're having here uh, and that we can acknowledge differences and celebrate them and learn from them in some ways uh, so that we can tackle these really challenging uh, questions. Um, I don't know how I've done with my time. I, th I think I've gone fast, but you know, I'm not too far off, I guess. Um, so I just want to mention in closing that if this stuff interests you, we have an annual summer school in social and cultural psychiatry that occurs in May and June every year. This will be the 29th uh, year and we have uh, a this year for the first time actually a workshop in contemplative studies uh, uh, put on by uh, Michael Lifshitz and others uh, uh, among other things and then we have in association with that every year an advanced study institute uh, which is a, just a, a three day two day workshop one day conference and this year it's on the situated brain so some of the ideas I'm talking about here with a very interesting group of um, philosophers and neuroscientists and others coming together so. Uh, I hope that if anybody's interested, you can find the information on, on uh, online very easily. So I will stop here. I honestly, I too many little screens open. I have no idea where I am time-wise, but I hope it's not too bad. We are applauding. Thank you. Lawrence, a masterful talk, an incredible presence. You were with us, uh, not just uh, in word, spirit, or... Uh, you were embodied without your body in many ways. Um, so thank you so much for that offering and for the consilience, was that a good use of the term? With the session, it, it really was uh, quite a remarkable um, triangle of converging um, views. Um, we are skipping our integrative panel and uh, we'll go to a few questions and then a coffee break. And we'll take a 15 minute coffee break so we can come back uh, close to four o'clock and end uh, close to on time. Um, so thank you so much. So um, do we have question? a question in the room for uh, Jennifer? Um, 
and uh, and then we'll take one from uh, from Zoom, and we'll see if we can uh, get uh, Lawrence back on. There you are. Hi, Lawrence. Thank you so much for your lovely talk. My name is Jennifer Dabemeyer from San Francisco State University. Now I see myself, but I see you a little bit there. <laughs> but I see you. That's, that's important. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, it's very inspiring to think about your um, context and culture-driven perspectives of contemplative science and hoping this can be the next generation of contemplative science research. And I'm wondering your thoughts about uh, existing models or programs of research in this area that you see that you could point to as examples or potential pathways. You know, what does this research look like? Is it cross-cultural? Is it taking like similar practices, looking at differences across cultures and contexts, or other ways of envisioning um, programs of research? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think from what I've said, one of the conclusions is it has to be multidisciplinary and multi-method. There's not going to be any one thing that's going to help us to do all the things that we need to do. But in particular, there's some things that need to be added. I, and I wouldn't rule anything out that people are already doing. I think it's all interesting and relevant. But there's some things that need to be added. So one thing is there are ethnographic studies of, of um, contemplative practices. Um, uh, you know, Sarah Lewis, uh, Julia Cassinati, other people, even um, even uh, George Dreyfus's uh, own account of his own experiences and training. So there, there are different uh, accounts that help us to get a grasp of what's going on, not in a uh, narrow functional way, what's going on in the brain, but as a form of life. Uh, you know, so to me, that's pretty basic that we have to be paying attention to that, especially since, again, where these practices come from is... Um, about having a different form of life uh, or, or transcending the mundane forms of life that are, that are harmful. So having the big picture, in other words, is very important. The flip side of that is having experience near work. And this is stuff that you know, goes back to Varela again, talking about uh, neurophenomenology and stuff, paying very close attention to the texture of experience. And there are efforts like with Claire petit and other people trying to have phenomenological interviews. The caveat I would say about this, and I said this uh, a couple of years ago at a, when I participated in a Mind and Life um, uh, workshop, was uh, I don't think that narratives that people give where they're recounting their experience are just a window into experience. I mean, they're always an account that is influenced by everything you've learned before and who this person is in front of you and what, you know, what the time of day is and all these other contextual things. So that's where a more sort of socially, culturally, contextually informed perspective can help us to, we can collect the data, but then to sort of read it in a way that pays attention to context, that doesn't treat it simply as it's just a, a readout of what was going on and that's all that counts here, that we need a more sophisticated way of approaching that. The final, or two final things, there, we have new technologies for studying things in context, so we can do experiential sampling, we can do real-time monitoring of all kinds of things, or, you know, you heard, again, this amazing stuff where because people need epilepsy surgery, there, you know, this otherwise incredibly invasive thing that can happen where we get this um, rich data about people who are moving around the world talking and so on, so it's extremely interesting, and, we, and those technologies are going to continue to improve. And then uh, we have colleagues, um, Guillaume Dumas here and so on, who's uh, trying to do two-person or three-person neuroscience, so looking at the coupling between people, and again, that was there in Uri Hassan's uh, study, available without doing an experiment there in, 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 uh, you know, in a free uh, situation. So uh, the potential to sort of understand what is going on that involves coupling between people, that involves synchrony and harmony or or disjunction, and, and that's also important. You know, maybe waking up sometimes involves disjunctions rather than everything just being uh, totally in sync. So I think there's a whole range of techniques. For me, the important thing is by having a comparative perspective, by having multiple perspectives, and by bringing critique to bear on our own assumptions, we open up a space to find something that is you know, maybe deeper, maybe more general, maybe more insightful. Thank you so much. We have a question from Zoom. Yeah. Do we? Um, thank you for that talk. Um, I'm curious, uh, because you were just talking about how, you know, and I agree that context is very, very important to consider in all of this, uh, but there's kind of this interplay between uh, people sometimes behaving in ways that they're not necessarily aware of. 
Uh, and so we don't re want to rely on self-report, like you said, completely. Uh, but at the same time, we know that two people will experience the exact same event completely differently. And so at what point do we kind of say, hey, uh, this might be a result of their context, their environment, the culture they're in, even if they're not aware of it, and is there a danger, and I think you may have just alluded to this at the end of the last question, of, of basically categorizing people a little bit too much, kind of putting some of the researchers' assumptions into that? Well, absolutely. And this is a common dilemma in psychiatry and cultural psychiatry. So there's a common situation in the US that occurs because of endemic racism, uh, where to be a black person in a racist society, one has to be alert to certain kinds of risks. Uh, and if someone is not, if a, you meet a clinician or a helper or somebody who, you know, wears the face of white privilege and has never really thought about that, uh, they may interpret your apprehensiveness uh, or your carefulness or your whatever as you being um, suspicious or mistrustful or paranoid. And there's a, there's a small literature on this making this point, and this can lead to misdiagnosis. So what's the antidote? Well, it starts with exactly what people are trying to outlaw in, in uh, Florida or whatever, becoming aware of the actual society that one's living in and what the background knowledge is, what the taken for granted is, uh, you know, and this is, doesn't come to us easily. I mean, for me, it's happened years ago. I had a student who was Haitian Canadian who told me it was very painful for her to go to the department store with her daughter because she was followed around by the plainclothes uh, detective, the you know, security person. And I grew up in the same town and went to the same store, and I never had any idea such a thing existed. So that was, I always I tell this tell the story hundreds of times at this point because for me it was a little epiphany. It was like, hey, wake up! You know, you think you're in the same world, but you're not exactly, or you're not you're not in the same position in that world. So what that's what when we talk about the other, it's not meant to other people. It's meant to acknowledge that we we have different experiences and part of honoring and respecting someone is being aware of that and being open to learning about that. So that's a, on a personal ethical level of how do we function, but it has immediate implications for research. You, want to, you, you know, you think people are experiencing the same thing. This point was made by Daniel Weinberger about all the work on um, default mode network and saying that, you know, depending upon the kind of mental health problem you have or who you are, your experience of lying in the scanner is fundamentally different. So to think that you, that's somehow some neutral stimulus that you're going to, you know, that's the default mode is nonsense. Some people are having intense reveries about what they're going to do when they get home and whatever. And other people are obsessed by the machine and where they are or who, who they just, you know, anyway, there are things going on. Uh, and to make sense of that, we, at some point, we have to get to those. And some of that's going to be by talking to people, but it's also going to be about learning about the context because we can only make sense of what people tell us if we have enough background knowledge to know what they mean when, when they're talking about certain things. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to draw this session to a close. And I think it's been self-integrating, uh, actually, <laughs> and self-reinforcing. And uh, we're going to give you a 15-minute uh, coffee break, um, tea break, snack break. And we'll be starting again at 4.05.